few things in life are certain. One is change. In the next 50 years, Colombia will be transformed in ways we can only imagine. Yet each of us can choose to simply watch what happens or to participate in shaping the future by making our voices heard. Before Columbia, Maryland became a city, it was a vision in the mind of its founder, James Rouse. A vision so powerful and compelling that more than 100,000 people now call Columbia home. I remember at the age of five or six, we would come up here every weekend to Columbia, and I would look around and I would see the fountain, everything here, and I could not wait to get to Columbia. And now here I am in my 50s living in Colombia, and I love it, love it, love it. I feel like there's a lot of awesome and talented people here, and I've made a lot of my best friends here. It is a special place. It's a unique place. It's a, it's a place um, that I think we can all be proud of because citizens care about their, the community. They care about each other. They care about the lifestyle in the community. Columbia is a planned city, a so-called new town in the corridor between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and so it grew without the urban sprawl typical of many American cities and towns. But what makes Columbia truly unique is its humanitarian identity that focused on the well-being of people and families. I've lived in Columbia since 1979 and have never thought of moving anywhere else. I've also had my career in Columbia, Maryland, which really was what James Rouse was looking for, that people would live here and work here and share here. Jordan Bainey did leave Columbia in his youth, but came back to operate his brewery business here. Growing up, uh, Columbia had a lot of great benefits that uh, I came to realize weren't in other towns. You know, with the Columbia Association, we had access to pools and ice skating, and there's an indoor water park and activities. He considers ethnic diversity the most important benefit of Columbia. Every school I went to there was chock full of people of all different races and colors. Personally, I think it, it forces us as individuals to accept other points of view, accept other people. Another benefit of living in Colombia is the chance to enjoy an abundance of nature and open space. In fact, a third of Colombia's land is preserved as open space, which was required by Newtown zoning laws in effect when the city was built. We have 95 miles of trails, uh, so almost anybody can get to open space within a matter of minutes. All the research says that it makes you much happier, much healthier, much more productive, and much more creative. People also love Columbia for all the fun things there are to do, like summer evening family concerts. Or the annual Wine in the Woods Festival, where people can get in touch with their wild side. It's not only fun that draws people to Colombia. Many families move here for the excellent schools. This class of first graders is working on a math problem with teacher Wendy Crockett. Nice job. All right, who wants to tell me how they solved this problem? And the 31 decompose it into a 30 and a 1. All right, someone have another way they solved it? Our schools also excel in the arts. In Colombia's first 50 years, the arts have grown and flourished with indigenous talent, like the Colombian Orchestra and the Pro Cantari Choral Group. <laughs> Colombia has been so impressive in so many ways that it was named by Money Magazine as the best place to live in America. By the city's 50th anniversary in 2017, Colombia was riding a wave of good feeling. Festivities celebrating its success continued for months. 
But much has also changed in the first 50 years. These changes are just starting to be visible and understood. The foremost change is downtown expansion. New luxury apartment buildings will increase population density. High-rise office buildings, parking garages, and changes in street patterns will give downtown a more urban feel than in the past. The changes raise profound questions about Columbia's future. Will the city carefully build on its success or become a victim of that success? Traffic congestion, overcrowded schools, and higher taxes could become reasons for concern about our future quality of life. Are we staying true to James Rouse's original goals? One was to respect the land. We, we believed it was possible for man to build his settlements without desecrating the land. So we preserved all the stream valleys, all the floodplains, all the steep hills. The second goal was to be a real city, not just a better suburb. It was our goal to produce as many jobs as there were workers here. We wanted people of all income levels. We wanted it to be very open racially. And this was back in 67 when the first families were coming here. We had black hostesses and white hostesses in the exhibit building. We made it an absolute rule that no, no uh, developer, no salesman, no leasing broker, no one could answer the question, what is the color of the person who's going to live next door? And we enforced that rigidly. We said, if you don't want to take your chance racially, don't come to Columbia. I love the vision of Columbia, being that all socioeconomics live together, that all ethnicities live together in these villages around town center. And each of these villages have apartments and single family homes and condominiums, even some Section 8 housing. Rouse's third goal was to produce an environment where people and families would thrive. So he built his villages to include interfaith centers and with places where people would naturally interact, such as the Columbia Arts Center in Longreach Village. And our fourth goal was to make a profit. So if, it, uh, if you could build the rational city and make money, why keep on building the irrational city? While Columbia's success has been widely acclaimed in its first 50 years, not everyone agrees that the city is headed in the right direction. Trudy Barksdale moved here in 1975, seeking a safe, affordable place for her daughters. She strongly believed in the Rouse vision. But how does she see it today? I think it's been lost. The company that bought the Rouse company was not the same. <laughs> they didn't have the same goals. Former County Executive Liz Bobo also sees changes in Columbia. Socially, we had communities where, as Jim Rouse said, the CEO and the janitor could live in the same community. We don't have that anymore. I believe that Columbia is becoming an elite community. People who are of even moderate income are finding it very difficult to move here anymore. Her husband, Lloyd Knowles, who served 16 years in Howard County government, perceives a change in priorities from those of Jim Rouse. The main ideas that he had, the last one, was the profit. That's moved up the ladder now, I think, to the first thing. Let's make the profit and then see if we can fit in some of these other ideas that uh, we might bring forward from 50 years ago. If priorities have changed, it results from a series of seismic events, earthquakes, in Columbia's history. They began in August 2004, when the Rouse Company sold its Columbia ownership to General Growth Properties Incorporated, also known as GGP. The price? $12.6 billion. The deal was considered the largest real estate merger in American history. The second event was in 2009, when GGP filed for bankruptcy. The third event was in 2010, when GGP emerged from bankruptcy and created the Howard Hughes Corporation, which became Columbia's new owner of undeveloped land. The Hughes Corporation would not agree to be interviewed for this documentary. But at a public meeting required by law, Hughes Vice President Greg Fitchett explained that they are now the successor to the Rouse Company. And what that means for downtown Columbia is we're the implementer of the downtown Columbia plan really uh, remaking it for the next 50 years. 
The meeting was about changes planned for the downtown lakefront, some of which seemed to contradict the approved 2010 downtown plan. Back in 2010, the idea of extending wind copping was thoroughly rejected. People didn't want it. Why are you bringing it up now? It, it would run right on top of a very popular community spot, the Columbia Association Amphitheater, where there are numerous concerts, movie the night, populated by many, many kids. Uh, putting a automobile traffic right on top of that amphitheater area, the idea is disgusting. I understand uh, your opinion on this. Um, this is something that we uh, did consider very carefully. Um, I don't think you know, that the idea that this is going to be like a freeway through here is completely uh, mischaracterizing it. Uh, this is going to be a very low traffic, slow traffic road. While opinions may differ, it's clear that downtown redevelopment is the most important issue facing Columbia in the next half century. Former Rouse Company architect Jervis Dorton offers his own perspective on the Hughes plan for the lakefront. They're building condominiums, three condominiums 15 stories high. And the building behind me, the American City Building, is nine stories high. So it's a significant change both from what we've experienced so far and what is allowed in the downtown Columbia plan. Buildings 15 stories high, he says, will wall off the lakefront from the core of downtown, which is on the other side of a little Patuxent Parkway. I think that 50% of the uses ought to be office space. And that is necessary to sustain the restaurants and other retail that's on the lakefront during the time. We need an active lakefront during the week, not just at weekends or evenings. Exactly what developers will be allowed to do downtown depends upon critical decisions yet to be made by Howard County government. It's important to know that while Columbia is often called a city, it isn't one. It doesn't have its own incorporated city government. Columbia's governance is something like the ancient Roman god Janus, which has two heads. One is Howard County government, the other is the Columbia Association known as CA. Both heads make decisions for Columbia, sometimes together and sometimes separately. CA is actually a homeowners association, the largest in Maryland. It provides recreational facilities such as golf courses, tennis courts, and fitness centers, which it sells to the public under various fee plans. But it also owns and maintains Columbia's open space, including pathways, lakes, playgrounds, and parks. The management of open space is spectacular. I can't tell you how many people I've taken around Columbia over the years, developers, they can't believe who does all this? Who plants those flowers, those trees? A great percentage is CA. That they do superbly. Milton Matthews, the president and CEO of the Columbia Association, explained his view of Columbia's governance. From the very beginning, ever since I've been here, I've always said and that Howard County government is local government for the Columbia community. County government offer public services. What we offer are private services because we are a private entity. He said that CA is heavily involved in developing parts of downtown Columbia. We're the third largest property owner in the downtown area, so we are very, very invested in the downtown area. We work very closely with Howard Hughes Corporation, who is the primary developer in the downtown area. The Columbia Lakefront is one of the areas where CA and the Hughes Corporation are cooperating in redevelopment because they own adjacent land. We certainly have close relationship with the Columbia Association and working with them. Columbia has been very important to the, to the fabric of Howard County. I mean, we wouldn't have the diversity we just talked about without Columbia. So I think that uh, Jim Rouse's vision isn't limited to Columbia. I think it's, it's actually touched and made Howard County uh, one of the most attractive places to live in the country. It's not just Columbia the best place in America, it's Howard County now. The Howard County Council is the legislative branch of county government. It has only five members elected from five districts who make major decisions for both Columbia and the county. Few government actions are more critical than regulating what developers are allowed to build. Howard County's planning board makes these decisions using two separate zoning codes, one for Columbia and another for the rest of the county. Columbia's code is called the Newtown Zoning Law. There's only one in the entire country like it. And so 
if you ask the question, is it complex? Well, if you only have the if you have the only one in the entire country quite like that, I would say it's pretty darn complex. The county is now in the early stages of attempting to rewrite and modernize this law. This is a development code for Newtown that's been in place for the last 50 years, and it was intended uh, as a set of development regulations written by the developer. Well, the developer is gone, but we have the legacy code in place. And so now, how do you transition from a developer-led process to one that the county is involved in? I'm here tonight. To for any proposed development, there are multiple opportunities for the public to get involved. But public opinion is only one factor. Val Lasdens gave us a written statement about what the planning board considers. The planning board is obliged, when making decisions, to apply standards of review that are found in the zoning regulations. So if the public objects to something, it can't be on simply an opinion that they don't like it. They must be able to give specific reasons, and those reasons must be related to the standards of review that the planning board applies. But zoning isn't the only issue that determines Columbia's development. Sometimes the county government and the Columbia Association disagree on future direction, and little or nothing gets done. This happened with plans to create a downtown park called Symphony Woods, located between the Meriwether Post Pavilion and the Columbia Mall. The Columbia Association originally backed a simple, low-cost plan submitted in 2008 by former Rouse Company landscape architect Cy Pamier and a team of former Rouse Company employees who felt they were staying true to Rouse's intention. We had a great vision, a great dream, had great concepts about this being a place for families to come to. He wanted a, a downtown park that would have a water feature and a restaurant and would really, really encourage people to come and spend time here. Estimated cost, $5 million. Though the Columbia Association appropriated $1.6 million for this plan, it never got built. So Symphony Woods remained a peaceful grove of trees and nothing more. Then in 2011, Mike McCall approached then Howard County Executive Ken Ullman with an alternate proposal for Symphony Woods. I didn't feel that, that the plan that was being proposed it was very traditional, um, very nice, but it, it didn't speak to arts and culture and it didn't speak to the future, uh, I didn't feel. And um, uh, I guess the County Executive Ullman agreed. The fight dragged on for years, until the Columbia Association eventually switched sides and joined the county in backing the McCall Plan. In 2017, the first structure of the McCall Plan, a futuristic music stage called the Chrysalis, was built and opened. And he was a great salesman. He sold the county on spending, I think the original budget was like four, maybe four million or something like that, and before they got done they had put in six and a half million dollars, which was more than we were paying for the whole park, including the fountain and the cafe and everything, it was five million dollars. So instead of having a beautiful park with everything else, we've got this one building. The disagreement between CA and the county delayed a park at Symphony Woods for years. Thinking about it reminds Pamier of Jim Rouse. He really wanted this park and you know, unfortunately he passed away before he saw it built. By Columbia's 50th birthday in 2017, the downtown expansion was going forward full steam. Large apartments, office buildings, and parking garages were rising up for all to see, but not without some controversy. Good evening, everyone. This is a regular monthly legislative It began when the Howard hearing. County Council, Council voted to grant the Hughes Corporation special financing to build infrastructure needed for extensive new construction downtown. This was done under a program known as Tax Increment Financing, or TIF. A $90 million gift. It all went to the development company, which is one of the largest and most successful in the nation. But every single Howard County taxpayer will be contributing to it. Its development would have happened. It should, but it might have taken another 25 years. I don't think it's good for Howard County to have the downtown Columbia development take 25 years to happen. I think it's better if it can happen in 10, 10 years, 15 years. I thought it was essential, 
not even necessary, but essential, because I believe that a downtown area has to have public parking. Right? And so the TIF, the largest portion of the TIF financing that we approved is going to provide um, public parking in the downtown area. I voted against it. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes we've made as a county. I think it's a mistake for a whole host of reasons. I think, first of all, tax increment financing should be used to inspire development. It should be used really sparingly. She explained that TIF financing diverts tax money from the general fund, so it's no longer available for other county projects. We decide what we want to prioritize, so maybe we don't want to build that road. We want to build a school, we want to build a park, we want to build a library. I mean, downtown Columbia is a prime piece of real estate, and I'm not understanding whatsoever why we would need to incentivize that, and certainly not to the tune that we did. That tune was originally publicized as $90 million. But according to Jen Terrassa, that's just the first part. She says the ultimate cost will balloon up to $170 million. I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think it's a big mistake. With TIF financing speeding up the pace of downtown development, serious problems could lie ahead for the Howard County Public Schools, according to board chairman Cynthia Valencourt. We are allowing all of this development to go forward in, in front of, ahead of, providing for the schools. And, um, it, and that's problematic. I think that we should be explaining to developers that if you build this before we have a school in place, the people you're marketing to are going to end up with a very overcrowded situation. And that, that's not going to be good for anybody. And they should not be able to proceed before we are able to provide the facilities. And then they should be given the option to help provide the facilities that their projects are going to require. But downtown isn't the only place where the population is growing and creating a need for schools and other services. It's happening, too, in Columbia's nine village centers as the owners and communities attempt to revitalize them. Some of those centers are struggling, and some of those centers are doing very well. Andy Stack, chairman of the Columbia Association Board of Directors, says while centers are supposed to promote commerce, the original Rouse vision was to offer more. They were looking at the village centers not only from a business point of view, but also from a social and a community point of view. The Rouse Company once owned eight of the nine village centers, but today the Kimco Corporation owns six, Hickory Ridge, Dorsey Search, King's Contrivance, River Hill, Harper's Choice, and Wild Lake. Kimco, based in New York State, owns hundreds of shopping centers across the nation. The company would not agree to be interviewed for this documentary. Kimco and I think the county in general believe that one of the ways to keep the village centers um, active and up to date and part of it was to bring in a housing component. I support the building of luxury housing here. I think it's important that Columbia adapt to the market. I think what's unfortunate is that neither the community nor our elected officials were willing to put any affordable housing in this development as a requirement. The changes Kimco has made in Wild Lake Village Center foreshadow their plans for other villages. While preserving some of the older businesses, Kimco has built a large luxury apartment building. Some residents are concerned these developments will destroy the ambiance of the village centers. When I came here, I didn't know anything about what was going to happen to this, this particular village center. Then she learned of plans to tear down many of the existing shops and a tree-lined avenue to be replaced by a large apartment building surrounded by parking. First of all, this is a beautiful area. I don't see the sense of destroying beauty. When I found out about these plans, I was saddened and disappointed. I always thought maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I would not have made that cho the choice to come here if I had known about it ahead of time. It's no longer what Mr. Rouse wanted. He built us a strong foundation, but we're at that moment in time where it is incumbent upon each and every person in Columbia to recognize that everybody has a part to play in the next 50 years of building that community. But how do we play that part? The simple answer is we get involved and active. Bridget Mugani knows exactly how it's done. 
For many years, she headed a residence group called the Howard County Citizens Association, or HCCA. We testify regularly before the county council, the planning board, and the zoning board, as well as other uh, bodies. They work closely with people in government and greatly respect them, she says, but don't always agree with them. Sometimes when we're on different sides of an important issue, it is a bit of a battle, uh, and we become fierce advocates. Uh, but we always look to work with people uh, as much as humanly possible. What are her concerns for the future? The downtown master plan uh, needs to be properly carried out. And uh, other than the density, that it, it's going to be a, a lovely plan that is going to result in a, a satisfying, vibrant downtown that works well for all of us. How can caring people get involved in planning Columbia's future? First, become informed. Read the Columbia Flyer or Howard County Times each week. Both provide excellent news coverage, editorials, and letters to the editor, which alert you to all the hot-button issues. Attend a meeting of the Columbia Association or of your own village board. Join an advocacy group, such as the Howard County Citizens Association or its partner group called The People's Voice. We put county information on our website each month so that area civic groups and residents can see hearing schedules and have input into decisions that affect the quality of life in Howard County. We also endorse candidates to the nonpartisan ethics ballot. How important is it for people to get involved? It's critical. Um, Citizens play an enormous role, and sometimes, sometimes they don't think they do all, all the time. Look, we've got a very educated population. We've got very thoughtful people. We'd be foolish if we didn't pay attention. At the kickoff celebration for Columbia's 50th birthday, U.S. Congressman Elijah Cummings recalled losing a civil rights skirmish in the 1970s. I had been trying to integrate a pool in South Baltimore called Riverside. And down on Riverside, we were beaten. Little children trying just to get into some cool water in the summertime. And I had gotten a picture that so many communities would not welcome a little African-American boy who simply wanted to go into the pool. Then fast forward a few years, I heard about Columbia. Columbia, a place where people intentionally came so that they could live together as one. They understood it. The James Rouses of the world, the ones who were bold enough to open the doors for all people. For me, Columbia was a place of hope. I talk about Columbia everywhere I go because I want the world to look at Columbia and say that is our motto. We must be the motto. And so I wish Columbia another 50 years, 50 years of hope, 50 years of allowing people to live together as one. Another 50 years of saying to little children that no matter where you started in life, doesn't mean you gotta end up there. Another 50 years where little children and adults can go and get in the cool water and realize that we're all one. May God bless you. May God bless Columbia. May God bless America.